just pray for a moment. Lord, thank you that you are here present amongst us this morning. Lord, I believe you're already at work in our hearts and in our lives. Lord, I pray that as I come to uh, share this morning, I wouldn't get in the way of anything that you're doing, that you'd speak uh, your words through me. And we offer ourselves to you as your people in this place. Lord, would you open our ears that we would hear what you would say to us this morning. Amen. So, first... uh, First Sunday of a new term, uh, and over the, just over the next three weeks, we're going to have another uh, look at, at three uh, elements of the up, in, and out. If you uh, remember about that, we've got a, a triangle up there, and it's to do with this thing of God being at work reconciling the world to Himself in Christ. That's the mission of God in the world: is to bring people to know Him, to be reconciled with him. And there in, in the diagram it helps us to see that that reconciliation uh, is an up reconciliation where we are able to be reconciled with God. There's an in element to that as he reconciles people to one another through him, through the work of Christ in our lives so we can be reconciled. We've had uh, stories this morning already of that happening in people's families. And there's an out part of this as we as the people of God reach out into the world to bring the reconciliation that he's done in us out to the people who are outside of these walls. So there's the up, in and out. And this morning we're going to be looking at uh, uh, an up element to that. Uh, And it's important as we start this to to remember that we are utterly dependent upon God in order to have any kind of meaningful impact on the world outside. We are utterly dependent upon God. We can sit together uh, with all our experience and all our knowledge and come up with great plans and ideas. It's a waste of time unless God is at the center of them. It is him who changes lives and not us. We are dependent upon God. And prayer is, is part of a language of dependence upon God. Whenever we pray and ask God to come and work, we're saying we can't do it and only you can. It's what prayer is. It's saying to God, I'm not up to this. So I'm going to cry out to you to come and be at work. And it's key, therefore, in all that we're doing. When we pray, we give God his rightful place in our lives. We humble ourselves before him. And we declare him our only hope as we do that. This is 1 Peter uh, 5, verse 5 to 7. God opposes the proud, but shows favor to the humble. Humble yourselves, therefore, under God's mighty hand, that he may lift you up in due time. Cast all your anxiety on him, because he cares for you. There's that element of understanding our role and who we are and who God is, and expressing our dependence upon him, and casting our anxiety on him. All that is on our hearts and on our minds, all those things that trouble us and worry us, all those things that we want to achieve in God's name, we, we lay them before him. We put it on him because he cares for us. So we as a, as a, a, as a leadership and as a congregation, we must be committed to prayer, and I'm delighted to be able to tell you that regularly, uh, in fact, all our elders meetings, we have a, the first whole chunk of our elders meetings is spent time in prayer and sharing what we believe God is saying with one another. It's such an exciting place to be. Dave was at his first elders meeting uh, last week, uh, and he just as he was leaving, he went, that was fantastic, wasn't it? And it really is. It's so great to be able to pray, to, to be talking about the stuff we should be talking about, to be crying out to God for the things that are going on in our church and in our community. It's an exciting thing. And we as a church are going to start on uh, September the 17th, on the Sunday evening, to begin to have a prayer meeting in this place together. It's going to be between half past six and half past eight. We've done that so that as many as possible may be able to get there. If you can come for the whole two hours, that'd be fantastic. But if you can't, please feel free to come for as long as you can. If you can just come for half an hour, we're going to have lots of ways that we can be listening to God. The goal of it is to be relational with God because our prayers, uh, we always make our prayers transactional. God, I want this and therefore I'll come to you and tell you what I want and hope that I get it. It's a battle for us 
uh, in our humanness not to do that. And we want to make this relational. God, what do you have to say to us and how do we respond to that? So that begins, we're going to just do that once a month this term. Uh, the third Sunday of the month in the evening, you'd be really welcome just to come and join us as we do that. And considering what's going on around us in our town and the task that is ahead of us in terms of the people that we want to impact for the kingdom of God, there's another level of humbling that Dave and I are beginning to sense might, God might be calling us to, as perhaps as a leadership, but also perhaps as a church. And we're going to talk about that this morning. And that is uh, fasting. Fasting is another, maybe, maybe a deeper way of expressing our dependence upon God. Uh, and over the last two or three weeks, God has laid it on my heart to talk about that as our up element of the triangle this morning. Because it's about our engagement with God and how we do that. And it's not something that's talked about very much these days. But did you know there's more teaching in the New Testament on fasting than there is on repentance and confession? That's a remarkable truth, isn't it? And Jesus taught more on fasting than he did on baptism. It's a, it was a significant part of, of, of living uh, life under God in the Bible. So what is fasting? Fasting essentially is choosing uh, the original language. It literally means no, no eating. That's what the word, the word is built from the two words, not no and eating. And it's choosing to go without food for a set period of time and for a specific purpose. For a set period of time and for a specific purpose. And the only problem with fasting, as far as I'm concerned, is the not eating part of it. <laughs> I'd, be, I'd do a lot more fasting if it didn't involve not eating. Uh, that, that's the only downside to it. But it's not necessarily, as I say that, it's not actually necessarily only food that we might fast from. Perhaps it's anything that might get a grip on us. Anything that could put a hook in us in our lives that might cause us to put our reliance on that rather than on God, perhaps. Perhaps for some, for medical reasons, fasting from food isn't an option. But anything that could, that could get a hook in us. Social media, alcohol, television, coffee. Our phones. Imagine fasting from your phone. There's an example in the Bible, interestingly, in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, and that's about uh, sexual relations within marriage. And he says, Do not deprive each other except perhaps by mutual consent for a time so that you may devote yourself to prayer. So fasting is not just about food. But generally, in the context of the Bible, that's what they're talking about. Choosing to fast, to stop doing something that is important to us for a set period of time and for a specific purpose. I now know that the thing Heather needs to give up is coffee. That's become clear. Because <laughs> that's the thing that, that, whatever the thing is on the list that makes us go, no, not that. <laughs> that's most likely the thing God wants you to fast from. <laughs> So let's just have a quick look at the history uh, of fasting. There was only one fast in the, in the law, um, which was the Day of Atonement. That was the only legal fast where it was required for people to fast. But we see in the Old Testament more than 20 individuals and communities fasting uh, uh, for specific purposes. Many of them are in repentance, and God speaks to his people and says, Return to me with all your heart with fasting and weeping and mourning. That's from Joel 2.12. Return to me with fasting and weeping and mourning. So often it's in repentance. But there's many other examples. In Judges, the whole Israelite army fasted during a war. David fasted for the health of his son. And in Psalm 35, he fasts for his enemies. Uh, Daniel fasted when he heard Jerusalem was going to be destroyed. When Esther had to go and speak to King Xerxes, she and all the Jews fasted. Ezra fasted before setting out from Babylon back to Jerusalem. That was about having a safe journey, about God's protection. Nehemiah fasted when he heard about the state of the holy city and he cried out to God for his help. Fasting is about expressing our dependence upon God. In Psalm 35, that passage where David's praying for his enemies and fasting for them, it, it uses this phrase, he humbled himself with fasting. 
Fasting is literally denying ourselves, which is the very words Jesus uses to call us to him. Deny yourselves, take up your cross, and follow me. David humbled himself with fasting. And that's why Jesus was so angry in the New Testament about the way the religious leaders and the people fasted. He talks about that in Matthew. And he talks about the fact that it was all about impressing people. So they'd dress in particular ways. So everyone knew they were fasting. They'd have a certain look on their face and, and things that they'd outwardly show so that everybody knows they're fasting. Why? So that people would be impressed. Jesus was really angry about that because it's the exact opposite of the point of fasting, which is to humble ourselves. That verse, God opposes the proud but shows favor to the humble. The very purpose of fasting is to humble ourselves before God. So is fasting for us today? Is it, is it an old covenant thing or is it something that God might call us to do today? This is from Luke chapter 5, verse 33. I think I might have that on there. Yeah, I have. They said to him, this, uh, they said to Jesus, John's disciples often fast and pray, and so do the disciples of the Pharisees, but yours go on eating and drinking, they said. Jesus answered, can you make friends of the bridegroom fast while he is with them? But the time will come when the bridegroom will be taken from them. In those days they will fast. In case you haven't worked it out yet, we are in those days where the bridegroom Jesus is taken from the earth physically, for a period of time before he returns. We're in those days. Jesus himself says, in those days, they will fast. Jesus himself fasted for 40 days uh, in the desert. So if you want to start, that might be a good place to start. Just uh, start with 40 days, see how you get on, and then maybe you can grow it from there. Um, in Acts 13, they fasted when they sent Barnabas and Saul out on mission. In Acts 14, they fasted when they appointed elders. Now you're wishing you'd fasted when you appointed your ministers, aren't you? <laughs> See what happens if you don't fast. And today, I believe, and many believe, it's an important spiritual discipline that has kind of fallen off the radar because it doesn't fit with the worldview around us of consumerism, of having what you want when you want it. Richard Foster writes this, In a culture where the landscape is dotted with shrines to the golden arches and an assortment of pizza temples, fasting seems out of place. Fasting is counter-cultural. It goes against what the world is telling you outside. For that one reason alone, it's a great thing for us to do as Christians. It stands against the consumerism of the world. Whatever you want, just go and get it and it's fine. It's part of our set-apartness to be able to say, actually, we don't have to do that. We can make a different choice. What is going on when we do it? What is God doing in us? How does not eating make any difference to what we're doing? If we're praying to God, if we have something on our hearts that we want God to do, how does not eating food or giving something up make any difference to that? What's, what's the link here? And the important thing to notice straight away is fasting is not about making God do what we want. It's not about saying, well, if I stop eating food, God, if I do this for you, then how you have to do what I'm asking you to do. That's completely uh, a wrong way of looking at it. It's not about trying to coerce God by making a sacrifice. It doesn't change God at all because God is unchangeable. What fasting does is it changes us. It changes us. Because there's a battle going on in us that the Bible talks about in many different places. And it's the battle between the flesh, our human nature, and the Holy Spirit that God has placed in us when we gave ourselves to Jesus. And the flesh is clever at what it does. Have you ever noticed, have you ever realized how clever your body is at getting its own way? Your body tells you it's hungry and you go, oh, I better go and eat some stuff because the body's told me it's hungry. Yesterday morning, uh, I was going to a, we were going to a barbecue in the afternoon. So I thought, okay, I'm not going to eat. I'm not going to eat anything for lunch. I'm just going to wait for the barbecue. And then I opened the fridge. <laughs> it was my first mistake. And there at the bottom of the fridge on a plate was my all-time favorite dessert, 
which is strawberry cheesecake. Just making sure you've all noted that. Strawberry, if you just write that down, strawberry cheesecake. And there was some left from the previous day. And what's more, it was homemade strawberry cheesecake. Elena made it. It's like... So I decided I'd have some strawberry cheesecake. So I cut myself a bit. I took it in the other room and began to eat it. Elaine saw it. She then went to the fridge and got some strawberry cheesecake as well. So I know how Eve feels now. And we even saved some for Josh, and then he came downstairs and we said, I said, do you want some? And he said, no thanks. Oh, one of, us is, one of us is safe. But we all do it, don't we? You have a good meal, and you sit down thinking, oh, I've had plenty. And then you think about the chocolate bar in the cupboard, and you think, oh, I might just, you know. And your body says, yeah, I want some of that, and off we go. We just run around after our body's demands much of the time. In Philippians 3.19, Paul writes about people... And he says this of them, their God is their stomach. They're controlled by their desires for eating. That's the thing that propels them around the house to get the things that they want. The body is used to being in control. The body is used to getting what it wants when it wants it. It's used to having its desires satisfied. It sends its signals to us, to the rest of us, and we go, yeah, okay, if you're hungry, I'll go and eat. And Romans, 5, Romans chapter 8 talks a little bit about this battle between the flesh and the spirit. So if you have your Bible with you, just quickly turn to Romans chapter 8. Or turn on your phone if you have an app. Romans chapter 8, and I'm going to read from verse 5. Those who live according to the flesh have their minds set on what the flesh desires. Their minds set on what the flesh desires. Those who live in accordance with the Spirit have their minds set on what the Spirit, the spirit desires. There's a battle going on in us. Neither, none of us are in either of those two places. We're somewhere in between with this battle going on between our flesh saying, I want this and you need to give me this, and the Spirit trying to lead us and direct us in our lives. The mind governed by the flesh is death right at one end of the scale if, if we completely turn our backs on the spirit and live purely for the flesh. As much as the world does, the, then the, goal, the, the end game of that is death. But the mind governed by the spirit is life and peace. At the other end of the scale is life and peace as we allow God to lead and guide us. The mind governed by the flesh is hostile to God, does not submit to God's law, nor can it do so. In other words, without, without the leading and the help and the direction and the strength of the Holy Spirit, we have no chance of getting to the other end of the scale. Those who are in the realm of the flesh cannot please God. So here's this picture of this battle going on. And in 1 Corinthians 6, uh, Paul writes about it again, and he says this, I have the right to do anything, you say, but not everything is beneficial. I have the right to do anything, but I will not be mastered by anything. You say food for the stomach and the stomach for food, and God will destroy them both. He's saying, have we got our priorities right? Have we got the Holy Spirit in the right place in our lives? He goes on in that passage to say that the body is meant for the Lord, not just for whatever it wants. Fasting is us saying to the body, you are not in control of me. You don't get to call the shots. It says to the body, you don't tell me what to do, I tell you what to do. And when you do that, let me tell you, the body will fight back. The body will give you every signal it knows to say, you need to eat something, and you need to eat something right now. Because the body knows how to get its own way. Fasting says, no, I'm not going to let you be in control because I've got something greater going on, something more important going on than just being satisfied today with food. I'm going to do something different or whatever else it is that we look to to satisfy us. No, I'm not going to look to that today. Fasting reveals how much our peace depends on things other than God himself, whether it's food, whether it's the internet, whether it's uh, coffee, Whatever those things are, fasting helps us to recognize that's not where we find our peace. Jesus himself in Matthew, he says this, Man shall not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. What is it that we live on? What is it that we depend on? What is it that we rely on? 
Is it what we want and when we need it? Or is it letting the Spirit have his way in our lives and crying out to him to have his way in our world? Letting him have his way in our life while we're crying out for him to have his way in our world. It's about putting our spiritual needs and the spiritual needs of those on our heart before our physical needs. It's about alignment, if you like. Aligning ourselves the way God created us to be aligned. Not being conformed to the pattern of this world, but being transformed by the renewing of our mind. Humbling ourselves, submitting to God, saying it's not about us. It's not about me getting what I need. I'm going to go to you for my hope. I'm going to go to you for my peace. I'm going to go to you for my satisfaction. Our hope isn't in food to sustain us. It is in God alone. In fasting, we're saying to God, you are more important than my hunger. You are more important than my cravings and my desires. And if my body doesn't agree, then it's wrong. Because you are in charge of me, not my body. I choose to deny myself for your sake. And what that does in us is help us to recognize the truth of what's really important in our world. So perhaps God is challenging you to fast. Perhaps there's something on your heart at the moment that you feel you've been praying to God for for a long time. Perhaps there's something just more recently that is big and significant in your life that you are bringing towards God at the moment. What fasting does is remind us of who's in charge. Reminds us that we're not the answer. That God is. Increases our dependence upon him. And perhaps to start with, you could just miss a meal. Perhaps it could be just a day where you say, between the time when I get up and the time when I go to bed, I'm not going to eat this day. Perhaps for some of these things you've been praying for for a long time, you want to put in a, a, a regular thing, a, a, a one meal the same day each week, or one day each week, or one day each month. Whatever you feel God is calling you to do. But remember, it's, this isn't about us coercing God to do what we want. It's about us recognizing our role in this and God's role in this. So perhaps there are some here this morning who are already aware of something. God's... Even as we sit right now, God's laying something on your heart that perhaps this might be a response that you can bring to it. If not, then uh, do over the next days and weeks. Just pray and see if there's something God wants to highlight in your life that you might be able to uh, 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 seek after in this, in this way using this thing called fasting. And just finally as we finish... Why, why us as a church? Why has God called me to talk about this today? What, what significance might it have for us as a body here? Well, what we know is that we're called to the world that's outside. We're called to a, a hurting and broken world. And more and more we're beginning to uh, uh, see and make contact with more and more broken, damaged, hurting people and we are on God's mission of reconciliation up in and out it's what we're about it's what we're here for it's why God's placed us in this town to do that work and this fasting thing that we may uh, be calling at time to do some of this together as a church for particular purposes and reasons firstly it's an expression of our earnestness our hunger if you like before God when we fast and we say Lord, we're going we're gonna to choose to stop doing this stuff or eating. We're saying, this is how strongly we care about our community. We want you, Lord, to know our heart. We don't just stand here and say, yeah, wouldn't it be great to see some people become Christians? Wouldn't that be lovely? L Lord, we, we, we long for this more than that. So we're going to show you our longing and our earnestness and our hunger by not eating or by fasting from something. Jeremiah 29, 13. God says, you will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. This is a part of showing that all our heart is in this. Lord, this means more to us than satisfying ourselves with food. 
So we're going to choose to do something different. And the second thing that it is, is an expression of our dependence. And let me tell you, you have called two ministers and we're only too aware of our dependence upon God. Let me tell you that so that you know that. Dave and I know we're not the answer to anything. We don't meet up and think, oh, isn't it great that we're in charge of this church and, and all the things that we can do. We are only too aware that we are not the answer, that we are utterly dependent on God day by day to do what he's calling us to do in our jobs, to, call, to do what he's calling us to do in this church and in our town. We're really aware of that. And, and fasting is a way that we as a whole church can express our dependence upon God. Because we do have a huge task before us if we want to truly impact this town for Jesus. And that task is a hopeless one without God. And I just want to finish by reading one more passage. Just turn your Bibles to Isaiah. See, in the Old Testament times, one of the things that people did was they just fasted, as we've talked about, to, to get their own way. Just have a look at verse 3 of Isaiah chapter 58. It's somewhere near the middle of the Bible if you're not used to finding your way around the Bible. Isaiah chapter 58, verse 3. Why have we fasted, they say to God, and you have not seen it? Why have we humbled ourselves and you haven't noticed? God, we're doing the stuff over here. We're making the sacrifices. You're not doing what we want. You're not playing the game. This is how it's supposed to work, they say to God. And God says this to them in response. On the day of your fasting, you do as you please and exploit all your workers. Your fasting ends in quarreling and strife and in striking each other with wicked fists. You cannot fast as you do today and expect your voice to be heard on high. God says to them, it's no good just not eating food to get your own way. Your life is not reflecting the same thing that you're trying to represent through your fasting. You're not living out the truth of who I am. So why are you trying to call upon me and make me do what you want when your life doesn't even acknowledge my existence, your behavior? Is this the kind of fast I've chosen? Verse 5. Only a day for people to humble themselves. Is it only for bowing one at one's head like a reed and for lying in sackcloth and ashes? Is that what you call a fast? A day acceptable to the Lord? Is fasting just a kind of spiritual discipline that we do over here? And, and just we, we make a show of it and, we, and we, we just do it before God with no purpose to it other than because we think that's what God wants us to do. God says, no, that's not the kind of fast I'm looking for. Verse 6, is not this the kind of fasting I have chosen? To loose the chains of injustice, to untie the cords of the yoke, to set the oppressed free and break every yoke. Is it not to share your food with the hungry and to provide the poor wanderer with shelter? When you see the naked, to clothe them and not to turn away from your own flesh and blood. Then your light will break forth like the dawn. And your healing will quickly appear. Then your righteousness will go before you. And the glory of the Lord will be your rear guard. Then you will call. And the Lord will answer. You will cry for help. And he will say, here I am. If you do away with the yoke of oppression, with the pointing finger and malicious talk. And if you spend yourselves on behalf of the hungry and satisfy the needs of the oppressed. Then your light will rise in the darkness, and your night will become like the noonday. The Lord will guide you always. He will satisfy your needs in a sun-scorched land, and he will strengthen your frame. You will be like a well-watered garden, God says, like a spring whose waters never fail. Your people will rebuild the ancient ruins and will raise up the age-old foundations. You will be called repairer of broken walls, restorer of streets with dwellings. God says fasting is in partnership with a life lived for him. We fast to humble ourselves before him, to show our reliance on him, to say, Lord, if we're going to do any of this stuff, if we're going to see any of this stuff happen in our community, we need you. We cannot do it without you. We are wasting our time if we try. So, Lord, we want to humble ourselves before you. We want to cry out to you and say, you're the only hope that we've got. You're the only hope that Dirham's got. And we call upon you and we humble ourselves before you in prayer and in fasting. Let's just take a, a moment. As we've said earlier, perhaps there are some here who 
just have a sense that their, their Christian walk has never quite got to where they, they wanted it to get to or where they believed it might. That, that sense of there must be more than this. And that response of letting God have his way is a, humble, is a, is a response of humbling ourselves. Saying, God, I don't know best. Uh, and perhaps there are prayers that you've prayed that he's not answered and letting God have his way and humbling ourselves is saying to him, Lord, whatever your will is, would you do that? Doesn't mean we shouldn't cry out for what is on our heart. We absolutely should. But we say to God, yet yeah, your will be done as Jesus did in the Garden of Gethsemane. So if that's your prayer this morning, then just take that to God. If there's something or someone on your heart that God has laid on your heart as we've taught this morning, then perhaps right now before God, just say to him uh, uh, what you're going to do in response in terms of fasting. Is there, is there something that you can do, something you can give up for a period of time, for a purpose, to, to humble yourself, to show God your earnestness and your dependence upon him? Just take the opportunity to do that this morning in, this, in these few moments. Perhaps for some it's just a case of, of, of giving your life to God in a fresh new way or for the first time to recognize that actually you're not able, you're not uh, uh, the right person to put your hope in, that, that you need your hope to be put in God himself through Jesus. Maybe that's a, something that's on your heart this morning. Let's just take a moment. What is God asking of you? What is he saying to you? If there is something on your heart this morning, then do take the opportunity to pray with someone before you go. There'll be people in that corner uh, uh, over there that would, be, that would love to pray with you or turn to someone that you've come with or someone that you know well in the church. Just take the opportunity to do that. Perhaps for some, if you're in uh, connect groups during the week, you can just share with them and have someone there pray with you. But let's allow God to work through those things that he's saying with others as we share with them. I think God's saying this to me and they can just pray with you to be strengthened to help to step into what it is that God is saying we're we're in this place together and God has called us to journey together there are others who he's put in your life to help you move forward with him as you share with them what he's asking you to do final uh, song we're going to sing king of kings majesty the chorus says this your majesty I can but bow I lay my all before you now In royal robes, I don't deserve. I live to serve your majesty. There's that picture of us humbling ourselves. We bow before the majesty. We lay everything before him. We humble ourselves. And then he exalts us. In royal robes, I don't deserve. I live to serve your majesty. As we humble ourselves, so he meets with us. He dresses us in royal robes. He sends us out into his world to impact those people who don't know him, as well as many others. I live to serve your majesty.